Uh, my name is Sonia Peterson. I'm from the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, and I have been um, organizing together with Christoph Böhringer from um, University of Oldenburg, and then my colleague Marte Windler and Christoph's colleague um, Jan Schneider, who is here today, um, this um, multi-model comparison project on um, yeah, carbon pricing after Paris, where we focused on different carbon pricing scenarios to reach the Paris targets. And and we have three papers here today from this project. And um, the first is an overview paper on the results of this cross-model comparison, which will be presented by um, Jan Schneider um, of the University of Oldenburg. And then there will be two more specific papers also related um, to the overarching theme. And I think with uh, Maud further ado, I give the floor to Jan. Okay, thank you very much, Sonia. Um, let me just quickly share my slides. So, okay, now that you have already, can can you all see the slides? Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now that you have already introduced the project, um, so I'm going to show the um, an overview of the results that we get from our model cross comparison exercise. It's in the context or it's core study of the project that we had on carbon pricing after Paris with the objective to uh, reach a medium term economic assessment of the initial nationally determined contributions, so the NDCs, that were submitted by countries uh, in the context of the Paris Agreement via our systematic cross comparison uh, from internationally established models. So. Uh, after basically taking stock of the current state of the Paris Agreement, we also devise more um, so-called core, we call them core scenarios or Paris regimes um, that reflect on the one side, an increase in emissions, uh, an increase in ambitions that we see in the initial uh, NDCs towards a two degree emissions traje trajectory. So the minimum temperature target that is uh, set out in the Paris Agreement on the one hand, and on the other hand, um, a scope of cost saving scope of international emissions trading and also um, regional implications of increased uh, international emissions trading in the context or in the framework that is set out in, by the Paris Agreement. And also we have an additional part on uh, household level incidence. So in our case, that is uh, on income deciles of CO2 pricing combined with revenue recycling back to households in individual countries, also in the context that we, that we lay out here uh, in our different Paris regimes. So the focus of the whole study is on <clears throat> CO2 from fossil fuel combustion as the major anthropogenic uh, greenhouse gas. Um, before I go into the details, how we set everything up and what, how the uh, exact results look like, let me just throw you some of our key messages uh, that we find from, from the simulations and from the cross comparison, the cross models, which is that global emissions trading uh, in most models cuts global cost quite significantly by one half by to two thirds, depending uh, on the model. Whereas we found rather limited cost savings, or at least in comparison to global comprehensive uh, emissions trading, when we only look at uh, emissions trading in energy intensive sectors. Then in terms of the incidence, we find a very strong incidence on oil and gas exporters. And when we go to the more wear flexibility uh, scenarios, so with, uh, emissions trading incorporated, we see some incidence shifting towards coal producers um, because emission abatement shifts over to coal. We find that as to specific countries, South Korea and Europe, are basically the only regions who benefit significantly from this emissions trading that is only in uh, emission intensive sectors, while China is actually rather indifferent on emissions trading in general in our scenarios. Then as to the household um, dimension, we find that uh, say across regions and across models, uh, the potential to overcompensate potentially regressive impacts of CO2 emission pricing via recycling CO2 revenues uh, back to households. Now, as the 
seen throughout the results. So to say what drives these results or all of the results, it's always a combination of direct effects that refer to direct abatement costs uh, determined by technologies and so on and so forth. And by secondary or spillover effects that are terms of trade effects, so through changes on international markets uh, and in particular fossil fuel prices and also prices for emission intensive goods that are traded on international markets. So as for the whole setup, the whole um, project or the, the cross comparison uh, comprises 15 international models, international teams that we see here, no, uh, 17, excuse me, 15 of those models are multi-region models um, that simulate all of the core scenarios. Two of the models are single country models that then uh, join in when we go into the household incidents. So <clears throat> as to the setup of the study, we have uh, the, a regional and a sectoral uh, aggregation or disaggregation that is, so on the regional side, we represent 14 major economic regions, um, eight of which are individual countries like the US, China, Brazil, India, <clears throat> and six of which are aggregated regions like Europe and the Middle East. And on the sectoral side, we uh, represent all the different energy carriers uh, in the uh, in the GTAP database uh, that is coal, petroleum, crude oil, gas, and electricity, where coal, petroleum, and natural gas are then associated with uh, CO2 emissions. Um, in non-energy sectors, we uh, represent the, the energy or emission intensive and trade exposed sectors, and uh, also transport, agriculture, and aggregate the rest uh, or the remaining sectors into manufacturing and service sectors. So that's the regional and sectoral aggregation. Now, um, as to the design of our scenarios, um, we devised business as usual. So the whole impact analysis is focused on the year 2030, which is the year uh, that most of the NDCs uh, state their, their target year in. So the policy targets that are set out in the NDCs are mostly formulated with respect to 2030. Um, and in order to create business as usuals in 2030, we uh, draw on two different sources, which is the International Energy Outlook by the EIA, so the IEO, and the World Energy Outlook by the IEA. Um, and um, so in order to, uh, to pay respect to the significance of the magnitude uh, of the results with respect to different uh, developments in the business as usual without counterfactual intervention. Then with respect to uh, emission reductions, we have one scenario that is just called NDC, where we reflect the uh, unconditional and lower bound uh, targets that are set out in the NDCs. One scenario, NDC plus, where we incorporate uh, conditional targets that uh, countries have set out and also upper bounds. So some countries state their target as a range of targets, for example, between 25 and 28 percent or something like that. Uh, and all of this refers to the initial NDC. So when, the, when we uh, devised all this, um, we didn't have access to the, to the second round NDCs that some countries have already updated in the UNFCCC registry. Then with respect to the third, third dimension, we look at, at different degrees of international cooperation. So that means different uh, settings of international emissions trading. We have one case, a case with, which is the reference case called REF, where we just impose the regional uh, NDCs. So there is no further international emissions trading. And then this, this case REF in the reduction ambition NDC basically reflects the, the status quo of the Paris Agreement. And then all other scenarios are basically Paris regimes that um, assess some maybe implications of some possible ways forward. So then as to international emissions, emissions trading, we have a case called global, where uh, we implement global comprehensive emissions trading across all sectors and all regions. One case partial, which is also global emissions trading, but all, uh, only in the emission intensive sectors. So that is our EIT sectors and electricity. And then we have two club trading scenarios where uh, <clears throat> with Euro-China, which is where the EU and China 
implement emissions trading in emission intensive sectors. And then one called Asia, where China, Japan, and Korea um, link the ATS in the emission intensive sectors. So that's the range of scenarios uh, that we cover. It's uh, another overview where we see that in total, we have um, 30 counterfactual scenarios um, with respect to the two baselines. In the paper that we have written up and also in this uh, presentation, I will focus on the, on the IEO base, baseline in order to keep it more comprised. Uh, and sometimes you will see the abbre an abbreviation just with a slash like NDC ref that ran, then refers to the combination of the ambition level and the cooperation mechanism that we look at. So NDC ref basically would stand for the status quo of the Paris Agreement, so the initial assessment um, that we make. So here's a brief look at our business as usual parameter. So this is what is... Uh, so the scenario setup and also these business as usual parameters are then streamlined across all groups and across all different uh, model simulations where we see basically uh, if we look at CO2 developments, a huge um, or the largest um, increase in China and India, for example, whereas, for example, already in the business as usual, we see a decline in CO2 emissions, for example, in Europe the US and Japan. So that's the basic setup, um, how we define the business as usuals. Then together with the business as usuals, we need uh, effective reduction targets that apply vis-a-vis -vis the business as usual situation in 2030 that we see here. So I won't go into the exact details how we translated these NDCs, but this is uh, basically a spreadsheet calculation on, um, yeah, looking into the NDCs and uh, calculating these effective emission reduction targets against our two different baselines. So what we see is um, the most aggressive targets or the highest targets in Korea, Europe, Canada, Brazil, and the US with respect to the business as usual development. Um, and the lowest targets um, against the actual baselines here in Russia and Africa and aggregate regions of Middle East um, we see that here in China and India, that's a special case, they both actually have in the NDC uh, ambition level reduction targets of 5% because um, these two countries uh, stated their NDCs in terms of GDP in, or CO2 intensity of their GDP. And one assumption that we made in the translation here is that even when that doesn't lead to real to an effective reduction target against the business as usual, we assume that there will be some degree of, uh, let's say, climate action uh, following these targets. So we actually implement a minimum target, minimum reduction target of 5% in the uh, status quo for these two regions. So uh, overall, just in the NDC, or what is implied by the NDC in terms of CO2 from fossil fuel combustion, we see that it is in both baselines around 10% or slightly below 10% compared to the business as usual situation, um, which is then scaled up uh, in order to reach a two degree target. One more thing we should say about the two degree target, how it is set up is uh, that here, we don't have any considerations on how this additional um, reduction requirement sh should actually be shared between different regions. So let's say normative standpoints or different metrics as to how to uh, spread out such a target. But we uh, took a, just a very simple approach and scaled up the emission or effective emission levels that we find in NDC plus and scale them in a budget approach in order to reach a plausible uh, emissions traje trajectory um, that is informed by integrated assessment models. So from the IPCC scenario database. So, um, let's dive into the results. We will first look at global results for CO2 prices at welfare and uh, want to compare the reference situation with a full uh, international or comprehensive international emissions trading situation, which basically gives the frame for all the conceivable results in, uh, within this exercise. 
So when we first look at global average CO2 prices, we see them here for the three different ambition levels NDC to, and to NDC uh, two degree over the different participating multi-region models. And we see in the lighter shaded bars, the results for the reference scenario, and then in the darker shaded bars, the results for the global trading scenario. So first thing that is uh, that uh, pops into the eye is basically a, a rather huge variety across models as to CO2 prices that we find that are implied by the different Paris regimes, ranging from 10 to $69 per ton of CO2 uh, in the lowest ambition level in NDC, and up to 164 under NDC2 degree. Um, and so the basic mechanisms, so, so the nice thing or the value added of this type of uh, EMF model cross comparison is of course that we can actually trace back these differences in the models uh, really uh, back to different technological assumptions and preference assumptions because for example, all the baseline parameters and the way that the individual scenarios are set up are streamlined across the models. So um, all of these models produce global, regional, sectoral, implicit um, marginal abatement cost curves that depend on the way that production and consumption is actually modeled with respect to structural assumptions that, for example, refer to the clem nesting and clem elasticities. So the way that uh, capital, labor, energy, and materials can actually trade off in, uh, in production and consumption, and also in the way that uh, fossil fuels are supplied, and for example, how uh, different new technologies or other technologies are taken into account, like CCS and so on and so forth. So what we here see with these uh, CO2 prices is basically the range of implicit um, marginal abatement cost curves that these models produce and then parameterized with our streamlined uh, scenario assumptions. So if we look at the same scenarios, but now with respect to global welfare, again, we see the lighter shaded bars uh, are the reference scenario and the darker shaded bars are the global trading scenarios. Again, we see a huge spread with the same uh, argumentation as before. Secondly, we see uh, the, the gains through um, global comprehensive trading are rather huge in most models, not in all models, again, depending on the specification, for example, on abatement options that exist in the power sector. But if we look, so one um, or, or two, uh, two results that seem kind of robust, at least if, uh, if we look at, let's say, the majority of models, or if we look at uh, average values uh, in these models is that we see a rough doubling of cost just when going from NDC to the two degree path without any emissions trading at all. And then for uh, the majority of these models, we actually see that the, ND, the two degree path <clears throat> with comprehensive global emissions trading is somewhat similar in terms of global cost to the NDC scenario without global emissions trading. So for example, here in the, in the victim model from Austria, we see here that the darker shaded green bar is in the same range as the lighter shaded blue bar, which is the case for, yeah, for the majority of models. So that's one uh, interesting result coming out of this um, Paris parameterization um, that we have here. So um, this is the, the global perspective or the, the global side of the results. Now let's go and dive a little bit more into the regional implications. Um, these are the regional CO2 prices. Again, what is underlying this, uh, these results is the, the regional MEC curves in, that, um, um, in this case, together with the reduction targets that we have shown before, so our translated NDCs, and then consequently we see the highest or we find the highest CO2 prices for Korea, Europe, Brazil, Canada, and the US. What we actually see here and uh, on, on the next slides are the box whisker plots where this line represents the median result. The green triangle is the mean result. Then we see the interquartile range in the boxes and then whiskers that show the last result that is within 
uh, 1.5 times the interquartile range. And then here in this case, we see outlier results. So that are outside of this 1.5 times interquartile range um, for CO2 prices. Uh, yeah, so, you have yeah. two, two minutes. All right, thank you. So then um, in terms of regional welfare, we see that we see a completely different ordering than with respect to uh, CO2 prices, which shows the, uh, that these direct abatement costs that we can actually infer from implicit regional MAC curves in the models are strongly dominated by indirect effects that are terms of trade effects via fossil fuel markets and via uh, item markets, where one very interesting, so for one, we see a strong incidence on Russia and the Middle East, although they had rather low effective reduction targets, which is due to um, oil and gas. And for example, for Korea, which actually had the highest emission reduction targets, we see a, a wide spread of results, but uh, also even strong positive outcomes, which is due to the fact that they're actually importers of oil and gas, which become cheaper, and are exporters of emission intensive products to some degree, uh, which can actually benefit them on international markets, uh, depending on the degree of substitutability of their exported goods. So that's the main takeaway here. We see a strong overlay of these uh, terms of trade effects, of direct, direct abatement effects. Then when we go into strengthening uh, the ambition level, what we find is actually an overproportional incidence on uh, our uh, fossil fuel exporters and regions that were actually only uh, to a small degree affected or even positively affected uh, show similar results when we scale up targets towards this uh, two degree scenario like Korea, India, Japan, Europe. So they can actually benefit from these high, higher CO2 prices around the globe. Um, whereas when we look at uh, the dimension of international cooperation, we find that uh, this actually leads to some shift of abatement towards uh, coal abatement options, so towards China, uh, China and India, which uh, leads to a shift on incidence actually on coal. And we see that, for example, regions that have profited before, like Korea, also the EU, uh, are not very favorable of this comprehensive international trading, or at least they, they don't uh, um, benefit from it on a larger scale, because now uh, oil and gas prices, which they import, adjust slightly upwards. And in general, the regional results, when we look at this international emission trading, are again uh, com composed of two parts, which is direct cost savings that results from the emission trading itself, so from this partial MEC curve uh, perspective, and then shifts in uh, terms of trade that I just discussed for the case of uh, Korea, for example. And then that also leads to the, to the fact that in most models, it is actually more beneficial for Korea to only have a partial trading uh, regime than a global trading regime, because here the, the, uh, the shift from oil and gas to coal is less pronounced, but still they are able to, to reap some direct gains from uh, emissions trading. So here we see net, uh, we see um, positive and negative positions in international emissions, emissions trading in these scenarios, which I will not go into in detail now. Our club scenarios again show that they are actually beneficial for Europe or for Korea in the clubs that they are participating in for the reason, reason that I've uh, just said. So there are, in this case, minor effects on these international fuel markets that they benefit from, but um, these effects on these direct cost saving effects from emission trading is still there. Whereas we see again that China is rather indifferent about these different uh, trading options. Then to briefly go into uh, the household analysis, we see that uh, eight models have actually disaggregated final consumption into uh, income deciles and have um, assessed the impact on the different households in a scenario where CO2 revenues are um, paid back to households in equal shares. And this is a summary of the findings. So uh, the marked line is the total welfare effect for the individual house income deciles. And we see the overall effect is positive for uh, the lower income households and then gets negative for higher income households. We see the decomposition here into an expenditure effect, which comes from real price changes due to 
CO2 pricing, so mostly increasing energy prices, with, which is in uh, most, not in all, but in most model runs uh, re uh, regressive. And then with this recycling, which actually makes, makes up um, a larger share of business as usual uh, welfare for lower income households, then overcompensates and actually leads to these um, more progressive results. And then when we pack all of this into a social welfare function, in this case, an Atkinson EDE, we see that for sufficiently high degrees of inequality aversion, uh, aversion we actually find uh, positive social welfare changes from these regimes. So emission pricing combined with uh, revenue recycling back to households um, in all of these model runs, and that is more or less pronounced um, given different uh, um, uh, levels of CO2 prices in the different regions, mostly. So just to very briefly wrap up, we see a global cost of initial Paris pledges of around 0.5%, depending on which uh, model you look at, which are very unevenly distributed, where we find in terms of trade effects actually dominating the direct cost that we would expect from a, from a marginal abatement cost perspective alone. Then increasing these uh, targets in order to, to go to a two degree tra trajectory, trajectory uh, on average or in total incurs additional global cost of below 1% in most model runs of BAU welfare and are even roughly cost neutral when uh, they're actually combined with a shift to more, say, more even CO2 pricing or comprehensive global emissions trading. Then emissions trading in general, comprehensive emissions trading can actually cut cost by one half or two thirds. So this is what, what has uh, often been found in studies that there's a huge saving potential from uh, such emissions trading. And then re referring to the last slide, we saw that combined with uh, uh, CO2 revenue recycling, we can actually see um, can actually have progressive policies, even without accounting for climate damages um, with uh, CO2 pricing. So addressing concerns on uh, that CO2 pricing can actually be uh, regressive and be uh, a larger um, or, be, uh, or imply larger adjustment costs for lower income households. So this, this is a yeah, brief overview of, of uh, our main results and what we found. And uh, so thank you, for, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jan. Um, actually, I, um, we have, I think, still some five minutes left for um, Q&A. And I would mm -hmm. encourage everybody to write some questions in the chat, or um, even though this is, it's a little bit against the script, we are such a small group here. Um, uh, I'm also happy um, if you post them directly, but still it would be great if you indicate in the chat that you're interested um, to ask a question, and I can't believe that in this uh, rather um, large uh, and rich model setting that there is no questions. So, um, or comments also welcome. Anybody? There is actually Maxim uh, wanted to ask a question, and um, please just go ahead. Uh, thanks, um, thanks, Jan, for the nice presentation and overview. Um, my question is the following: So, in in the EMF exercise, we cover CO2 emissions from fossil fuel combustion only. So essentially, we left out CO2 industrial process emissions and also non-CO2 emissions, which largely are associated with agricultural commodities. And mm -hmm. in, in total, these two categories represent like around one third of, of global emissions. And also non-CO2 emissions, um, if, if the carbon price is put on them, they would probably have a much more significant impact on food prices. Mm -hmm. So essentially impacting the lower income households. Mm -hmm. um, and, and my question is to what, I, I mean, did, did you discuss this uh, feature and limitation of, of all our studies in general? And to what extent do you think it might change the results uh, of you know, distributional impacts and also um, overall, overall impacts of, of the study? Thanks. Yep. Okay, thank you. So, uh, no, of course, that's very relevant and we, we have discussed it. So, in the end, we, we opted to go with the CO2 from fossil fuel combustion setup. And, uh, of course, 
I mean, one, if I, if I go back to my slides, uh, okay. So, uh, for example, the uh, the issue of agricultural emissions obviously plays plays a huge role um, in Brazil, right? We have Brazil as an individual region here in in our study, and find these impacts, find rather high emission reduction targets. If we if we go back here for Brazil, uh, and also then due to these rather high targets for Brazil that are um, excluding agricultural and all in general, uh, Lulu CF targets, we find, for example, um, this actual uh, uh, importing position of Brazil on the CO2 market when we go to the international trading scenarios, right? So uh, now, obviously, if we would incorporate more Lulu FC, uh, Lulu CF uh, emissions, um, then in particular for Brazil in this case, now let's stick to this example, this picture would probably just uh, be flipped, right? And then we would see um, more uh, an exporting side for Brazil. If we go to the incidents uh, discussing uh, the, the, the regional incidents, let's say, of course, results um, would change in that sense that I've just talked about, um, but, uh, so yeah, so you would go, you would go need to go into individual countries and also examine the uh, the indices for specific targets, for example, for the land use sector. And then, and what we have done here specifically for this study is, when we translated the indices, is actually to to come up with some correction factors for countries or regions that have uh, stated their targets with respect to overall greenhouse gas emissions, in order to try. To only look at CO2, so um, so in general, yes, of course you're right. It's uh, significant the non-CO2 or non-fossil fuel combustion CO2 emissions, but um, from from this alone, it's uh, hard to speculate how the overall results would change if we uh, incorporated that uh, in a comprehensive manner. I mean, and the same is for for the household side, right? Then. Of course, we, we would have impacts on uh, on other goods than just the energy goods that are used by households. So we would see a larger impact on food products, which actually uh, typically um, also compose a higher share of the income for lower income households. But again, we would also see more revenues that at least in these as if scenarios, they are again recycled back. Um, it's at least plausible that again, uh, there is some scope to compensate or even overcompensate these additional impacts. Okay, actually, I don't see more questions. And since the um, allocated time to this uh, presentation is also um, over, I would then thank you, Jan, again uh, for presenting um, our work. And then I would actually hand over um, to Israel Osorio Odarte from the World Bank, um, who actually teamed up in this exercise, I think, with some people from Purdue, uh, among them Maxim. And he's going to present um, a paper on the distributional impacts of carbon pricing policies under the Paris Agreement. Um, into an intra-regional perspective. And in this paper, you actually pick up the two main focus of this entire exercise, these distribution effects among regions, which um, Jan uh, focused on already, and then um, within regions. And I'm very uh, looking forward um, to your presentations. And to all the others, by the way, you can also start asking questions right away when you have them by putting them in the chat, and then I will moderate them afterwards. Okay, so. I mute myself now and give the floor to you, Israel. Uh, thank you, Sonia. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, I will present this uh, this work, no, jointly developed with with Gita, no, with Maxine uh, Chepelev and, and Dominique van der Menkruge. So I have the privilege to present, and, uh, and I also have the privilege to have here Maxine. So that can help me with the hard questions of the CG model. Um, and also, Maxim, feel free to to jump in. No, if if there is a specific uh, thing that I am not making um, uh, 
I'm not saying properly about the mechanism of it. You want to say something that complements the presentation. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in this paper, you know, as it was mentioned before in, in Jan's presentation, we are um, following the same EMF 36 exercise. Uh, and I'm going to skip part of what was presented in the previous presentation so I can focus more on how we link the distributional, um, how we constructed the distributional aspects of this global model and also what are the main insights that we get from um, the, the changes in global income distribution and how we pass the shocks from that macro model into the micro model. Um, so with, uh, with that, let me start. And um, so the, the motivation, no? as, as uh, Jen mentioned, um, we are on an all time high global uh, greenhouse emissions. So, uh, and, and, and reductions of these uh, gas emissions with, uh, are associated with significant implementation costs. So in this model, we follow, uh, as in this exercise, no, several um, uh, ambitious targets and cooperation efforts. And the particular focus of, of this study is to find national determined contribution to, uh, uh, analysis uh, that are consistent with the global climate mitigation policies. And we take into account both in terms of inequality, one is what we call inter-regional impacts or the between region um, inequality. And also we try to focus on the within region inequality or inter-regional impacts. Um, we are following, as in Jan's presentation, the same um, uh, construction of the scenarios. So on one side, we have the mitigation scenarios and we have, we will focus on uh, where we are taking the baseline of the, of the wheel, but also we have the, the baseline based on the, the international energy outlook. No? We are just presenting the results of wheel. No? And then we have three emission reduction scenarios. One is the NDC, which, as was mentioned, is the unconditional NDCs uh, up, to, up to the year 2030. We have the NDC plus, <clears throat> which is more ambitious and that has conditional NDCs. <clears throat> and lastly, we have an NDC with, that is consistent with the uh, reduction of emissions um, towards the two Celsius degree back. No? So from going from one to three, we have the less stringent scenario of NDC and going all the way to the more ambitious that are NDC with the two Celsius uh, uh, target. And uh, as in the other scenarios, we have the cooperation no? with the REF, no? which is basically only through regional action and there is no more cooperation. And then we have the more ambitious global cooperation, which is the scenario number two. No? Uh, and then in the middle, we have the, the partial on there is only global, global trading in energy intensive and trade exposed sectors. And then also we have other partial uh, cooperation scenarios that are club trading between the EU and China and uh, club trading in Asian countries. This is similar to the previous one, so I will I will skip uh, in terms of that. And I want to show you, I'm, I'm skipping this uh, in the interest of time. So how we put this into a top-down um, methodological framework. So we start as in other scenarios, we build the baseline. We have emission reductions. We pass it through the to the global equilibrium model, and then there is a linkage that goes into our um, distributional analysis model that is called the global income distribution dynamics that is called the G. And with this, we derive inequality measures that I will show you uh, in, in the part of the, of the results. Um, the modeling framework is called Envisage. As you saw in the previous presentation, it gives you results on the upper end of the 
of the comparison between all these uh, all these models. So it's calibrated to the 2011 base year using the GTA Power 9.2 version. It has a nested energy demand, which you can see in the figure. We have energy that is divided in electric and non-electric, and non-electric is divided into coal, oil, and gas, and all oil and gas is subdivided. So as it's a dynamic model, so um, in this respect, it has uh, labor growth that is followed by, by skill. In this, in this sense, it's linked with the household survey. Capital growth is a function of savings. We have exogenous land, uh, energy and trade productivity. Very important in this model is the incorporation of British capital um, and the level of substitution in capital is, is, is higher for newer vintages of capital. The current mapping is that we have, uh, as in the other 29 sectors and 28, 28 regions. In, in this, in the, in the JIT model, the, the micro simulation model, we are putting together a household service from 130 countries. This, house, this database has together 10.5 million observations. Um, each its household service are recalibrated, so or reweighted to account for changes in demographic structure that are linked to the CG model. And at the end, we have a new a new household survey that can help us to draw the typical measures of of poverty and inequality, the poverty headcount ratio, and different measures like the Gini and Teo coefficients, and et cetera. This is the basic linkage of the two models. So at the beginning, both models take this exogenous population and education projections. They both share this growth of skill and unskilled labor. Um, the model is solved at the CG, and then we apply a soft link through key variables that I'm going to show in the, in the next slide. So the, the main variables that are transmitted from the macro to the micro are wages. Uh, and, and so wages for four types of workers that are skilled and unskilled, agricultural and non-agricultural workers. We also have labor reallocation between these between these two sectors, agricultural to non-agricultural, by type of skill. We have consumer price index of food and non-food. And lastly, we have a welfare measure um, that is transmitted throughout the, 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 the households. So these variables are what we call linkage aggregate variables and are, and are basically are driving the distributional impacts for each country. Um, so I will skip that and I'm gonna try to jump into the welfare impacts. Uh, this is similar to the previous presentation. So we see that we have in, in light blue, the ref scenario and in orange, the global scenario. And these two are on, on each one of the, the largest and the smallest effects on welfare. <clears throat> um, so typically the ref scenario gives you in each one of these blocks, the largest negative effect on, on welfare. While if you go towards a global cooperation from ref to global, global gives you the, the least decrease in welfare. But also on the horizontal axis, when you go from NDC to NDC plus to NDC to Celsius, the more ambitious um, uh, carbon reduction or emission reductions leads to um, leads to larger decreases in welfare. So this is one part of the simulation, and what it is telling us is that as we go for more ambitious reductions, we will expect larger decreases in welfare, and as a result, a larger impact on global poverty. But you know, if we move from REF with no cooperation to the global cooperation, then part of that will be 
<laughs> part of that welfare will be will be actually more, more positive. This is one of the linkages that we are using welfare impacts. Um, the next one is food and non-food prices. So for this is the results for the NDC, and the next one is the results for the NDC with the two Celsius. What I wanted to compare in these two graphs is that typically the non-food prices actually increase or the increase in non-food prices are larger than the increase in food prices. So yes, food prices increase, no? but as we move into more ambitious scenarios, we see a larger increase in the non-food components. So in terms of relative prices, the, the poor households, they bought a larger share of food, no? but also there is this component of a higher increase in the non-food items no? that will actually hurt more the, the, the more uh, wealthier um, households, which tend to consume a larger share of non-food. Um, lastly, uh, in terms of the how we transmit the shock, you know, we also see that there is a decline you know, in as we move from the NDC to the more ambitious NDC to C. There is a larger decline in orange you know, of wages for the skilled workers, and this is this is in general term. So. Uh, the more ambitious scenarios uh, hoard more wages for top income earners that are skilled than for the wage skill. And also, there is there is a sectoral reallocation uh, that that hoards more people in the non-agricultural sector. So, just to summarize, what we see here is that more ambitious scenarios have. Um, Largest negative effects on welfare. They have largest increases in non food items, and also they have a largest uh, declines in the wage of skilled labor. Um, this is the, this can be translated into what are our impacts on, on poverty. And with these two tables, I want to present just the summary statistics of what we found. In, in the different uh, scenarios. So in this one, um, and feel, feel free to, to interrupt. So I'm, I'm showing the poverty line you know, for each one of the different measures of poverty that, that we use at the World Bank, going from a very low poverty of $190 a day, all the way to a notional global middle class line of $10 a day. And on top, we are showing the percentage of people in the world that lives below each poverty line. And on top, we are showing that uh, as a percentage and, and down we are showing that as millions of people. So, for example, living with $1 a day, you know, it is expected that by 2030, still 8.8% .8 of people will live below or with less than $1 a day, $1.90 a day. And this is equivalent to 632 million people. On the other side of the table, you know, we have increases with respect to baseline by 2030. So if we concentrate on the first row, you know, in all the scenarios, there is a positive increase in, in the headcount ratio and obviously in the number of people living in poverty. But also, you know, as we move from NDC to NDC plus to NDC to C, the increase in poverty is becomes larger. Meaning, as we saw, that the more that we move into the more ambitious scenario, the highest is the impact on poverty. So more people will be living in poverty. And uh, we also see that in REF, these impacts in poverty are larger than the impacts that we observe in the global cooperation scenario. For example, at $190 a day, which is our line for extreme poverty, we can have 7.9 million people falling into poverty with respect to baseline by 2030 if we go for the more ambitious 
to Celsius uh, NDC scenario with, with the REF style cooperation. But if we move toward global cooperation, that is reduced in 5 million to 2.9 million. That is uh, basically saying you know, these trade offs between going more ambitious and having more global cooperation. That's in terms of poverty. Also, it's important to say that if we jump from the $190 a day to the $10 a day, which is a notional line for global middle class, these numbers are actually higher. So we could, if we go for the two Celsius reference, uh, ref um, scenario, uh, up to 23.7 million will not, will be below global middle class as a result of, of this mitigation scenario. And this can be reduced by by 5 million to 8.7 if we start with the global cooperation. So this table summarizes that the impacts are felt larger in the in the middle and top parts of the of the distribution rather than at the bottom. That is one of the takeaways that we can have from this. Now our contribution also in this paper is explained in this table that shows uh, different inequality measures uh, on which we can decompose what happens with between and within country, within region inequality. The, the GE0 is the, the generalized entropy measure for inequality. And this, um, it, it has an alpha parameter that is expressed in parentheses. So the larger the alpha parameter, is the more sensitive is this indicator to the top parts of the income distribution. Uh, but in general, um, again, this uh, this table shows our uh, index of inequality in the baseline and changes in each one of our scenarios. So let's concentrate on on the on the first row. So we have a G0 of 83, 83 points, but then we have two components, the between group inequality and the within group inequality. And this is the, the what percentage of this inequality corresponds to the inequality that happens between, between regions and what component is happening in the within, within region inequality. Um, as we move into the scenarios, we see that inequality in the first row is declining. So this is the first evidence that uh, inequality is declining as, as, a, as a result of this, of implementation of reduction in, in greenhouse uh, gases. Uh, but also the more ambitious scenarios reduce inequality, global inequality further. Now this has two components, and actually uh, it, it's it's consistent throughout all the scenarios. This reduction is driven by two by two aspects. There is an increase, you know, a regressive increase in inequality between regions, and this is because most of the of the gains are well. There is an increase in inequality between regions because most of the damages are. Are, are being felt by poor countries. So there is a widening gap between the average level of each country. Nevertheless, <clears throat> inside each country, we see a decline in inequality because top income earners are those that felt more, uh, the, 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 are, are those that burden most of the damages. So the overall effect in inequality is is going um, is going down. Is relative to the less. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, we in the paper we show these results. No. So these tables you can look at carefully. We also presented this in a series of growth incidence scores. No. And we have this growth incidence score for each region. Obviously, it's difficult to see in the presentation, so I'm going to zoom into one that is for the case of, of one case for India. You know? And 
What we see is on the horizontal axis, what is the percentage of household income consumption? So on the right side, we have top income earners, and we see the, the percentage change in their household consumption with respect to baseline. So what we see here is that poor, poor households are actually pretty much indifferent to, to each one of the policies. So they are better on their, the, the, the 2C global, no? a little bit better. But what we saw here is that it's actually top income earners, which are hurt the most on their, <clears throat> on their each one of the scenarios. So this is very relevant and what is driving this uh, progressive effect you know, is, is two things. Is in, in one part is the increasing the non-food prices that affects more top income earners, but mostly you know, the reduction in, in their relative wages. So the, the reduction in wages for skill labor. So as global economic output declines, you know, <clears throat> Demand for skilled labor reduces, and this reduces the relative wage premium. And this is what we observe <clears throat> throughout the different uh, regions. So, as to conclude, now we analyze the distributional impacts of different uh, <coughs> carbon pricing mechanisms. You know? um, we found progressivity of income distribution at the global level, uh, supported by, by several inequality indices. There is a moderate um, uh, evidence of between region uh, increasing inequality. And just to conclude um, what we have as a as limitation of this study, you know, the, the GID or the household survey are missing some important countries. We cover 80, close to 85% of the population and GDP, but we are missing some countries, particularly Saudi Arabia, Korea, and Japan. Uh, we can have a more detailed sectoral disaggregation because we are only working with two sectors, agricultural and non-agricultural, but we are trying to, to incorporate more sectors in the, in the micro simulation. Uh, we can go for more ambitious and longer term climate mitigation effects that go up to 2050 or 2100. Um, Obviously, there is the inclusion of other greenhouse uh, emissions. And, and we are not considering the effects of climate change that will have you know, on, 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 on poorer households. And very important, you know, in, this, in this scenario, we are not consider, considering any transfer payment of compensations you know, that can actually change the, the distribution of, of wealth. Um, with that, let me conclude and um, floor for, for questions and comments. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, actually, in this case, we do already have a um, first question in the chat. And Rafael, since you were, um, <laughs> think your video is on anyway, why don't you just ask? the question yourself, I think, in this small round. I don't uh, I'm following your suggestion, Sonia, so I, I sent it to the chat, but I, I'll be happy to comment. Thanks, Israel, for the presentation. My, my question, my, I ha actually I have two questions, but the first one uh, relates more to the food and non-food prices. So if you could comment a little bit more about the share of uh, transportation costs in the food prices uh, basket or index, uh, I don't know how you treat it. Because my guess is that uh, depending on the country where you are uh, 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 focusing uh, the, the, pr the the carbon price would have an increase in, on, on transportation costs and that would relate to uh, stronger pressures on food prices so that's that's my my impression uh, if you could comment a little bit more about this and then I will come to them the second question is more a general comment actually thanks no yes you are right Rafael the the transportation cost will vary no i mean it's it's bundled in this non-food non-food price index um and there is a limitation on, on collecting and putting together a global collection of household service no? we need to estimate angle curves no? so for some countries we have the food and non-food share for others we don't and we impose the global angle curve approach to have this food and non-food share 
Um, uh, it's possible to decompose this, the transport component, uh, especially if you work with, with the specific countries you know, that have detailed household service. But you are right. Uh, it depends on the country which part of the distribution um, is, is, is affecting this transport cost. In some cases, you know, poor households actually don't consume a larger share of, of, of transport. Um, it's, it's probably the middle class and the top earners. But that depends on, on, on the specific, uh, um, let's say, the level of, of development of the country. As you move higher, you know, then uh, the, the first decents of the income distribution starts to increase the share of, 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 of cost of transportation. What we observe in the household service is actually what the household pay. So you have also that effect that in, in many countries, you no know, transport costs are subsidized, you know, the cost of energy, the cost of gasoline. So that, that is also an important, an important component. Thanks, thanks, Israel. Yeah. Uh, Probably Maxim would like to to expand on this food and non food at the CG level. Yeah, a, a quick comment. So I yeah, I just briefly check the cost structures uh, by by different countries. So in primary agricultural commodities, the share of petroleum products, uh, mm -hmm. which essentially go to transportation, is around two three percent on average. Uh, like two percent for India, a bit. Uh, two percent for China, somewhat higher for India, but then uh, in the process commodity, it's it's really small, so below one percent. So I mean, it's it's not high, so high share of when we compare non-food component with energy. Uh, well, uh, where, where we have electricity and direct consumption of petroleum and so on, where it can reach ten, twelve, and, and more percent for households. So, of course, it has an impact on food prices, but again, relative to aggregate bundle of noon food prices, food prices increase at a lower pace. So uh, there is this pressure of transportation cost, but it's not, not so large. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, but in that case that you're referring to primary commodities, right? But uh, probably consumers are taking, let's say, rice and beans and then, or any other processed food. So that that's it's kind of... Yeah, so in process, yeah. I'm, I'm looking, sure. looking at, for, mm -hmm. for example, for in the case of Brazil, uh, yeah. they co cover a large distance and there's a high impact in inflation when uh, food, uh, fuel prices increase. So it's, it's a really a concern there. Okay. Yeah, so for processed commodities, for instance, in, in India, uh, the share of transportation varies between 2 and 7%. So. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think, Jan, you have a question as well. And actually, I think there's just not a hand for everybody. You can just indicate in the chat if you would like to raise your hand and then I let you speak yourself. So, Jan, if you post your question and then I might have a last question and I think then the time is over. Okay, thank you. So, I was wondering about this uh, preference shift, whether you uh, know something about uh, how sensitive your results are actually to this shift of preference and um, was wondering whether it basically uh, shifts the magnitude of uh, the results that you find or whether it also has a qualitative significance for, for what you find. Uh, to be honest, that question is up to Maxime, no? <laughs> in, the, in the CG model. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, can, what, what specific preference should do, do, do have in mind, can you? Yeah. So there was on the on the slide with the model description. Oh, okay. Um, you showed a, that there is an I guess an exogenous shift in preferences yeah. implemented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. that's for the baseline calibration on the year. So we we keep preference shifters fixed in the policy scenario. So essentially, what we do with the preference shifters, um, we so we have some specific shares, for instance, of renewables that we want to target in their uh, baseline scenario. For instance, the share of solar and wind is small. Initially, we see the reduction in costs over time, but this reduction in costs is not 
enough to meet, for instance, this specific uh, solar wind shares that is projected to be observed in 2030. So what we assume is, okay, there is definitely, in addition to some economic drivers, there are also some social drivers, like just a preference towards uh more green towards greener more renewable electricity or you know electric vehicles for instance so we have an increasing share of electrification and also both in transportation and uh in some other industries so we we implement this via preference shifters uh so okay, again it. it has an impact on baseline but <laughs> doesn't have any impact on on the policy scenario okay thank you yeah and, and one thing that i that i should mention is that at the micro simulation no it's very mechanical exercise we are letting the behavioral change to happen on the macro level. So we could implement a demand system at the micro level, but in this modeling framework, it's just very mechanical. We are transmitting that shock, and, and there is no behavioral response in terms of demand system at the micro level, but you can decide if you want to do that, especially if you are working with country-specific simulation and you have the larger set of variables in in, 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 a, in a single country household survey. Okay, thanks. I think I will save two minutes in the end of the closing of the session and use them to ask one question myself, and that is, if I understand this um, presentation, the results correctly, then it's even, I mean, the first step that we also did in the EMF is um, to not focus only on a representative household, but um, to do this in company sales. And um, also you got the result that then um, the um, outcome can be um, actually progressive. But that's not sufficient if you look at your poverty results, right? So even if you have a progressive, um, um, a more progressive um, uh, distribution, it can still be that there is actually more people suffering from poverty. So one should, I mean, especially in non-industrialized countries. So I think one big message here is it's not even sufficient to look at household distributional results, but one should really not forget that it means that their absolute poverty will increase in, in some countries, right? Yes, exactly. And 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 I think uh, probably we would like to discuss this no in a more in a more um policy environment, mm -hmm. no, probably in another in another outlook, no, not so technical. But but in general, no, the growth incidence curves are very telling. So it varies by country, no, as I was showing mm -hmm. for the case of India. No, actually the in the case of India, the poor are actually better off in all scenarios. Probably by a small margin, no, probably mm -hmm. they are indifferent, but the big burden is is happens for top income earners. So if you think more or less in a in a political economy mm -hmm. perspective, no, the poor are rather indifferent about okay. the mitigation target under this yeah, this is scenario. So if you ask the poor, well, well, I really don't care. I'm more or less the same. No, but if you go to the top income earners, no, they would like to go uh, to avoid no mm -hmm. more ambitious targets. No, they are actually better. No under just the, the national determined contribution. Mm -hmm. That is happening up to 2030, no? under with no climate change effects. So that, okay. that is that is one of the aspects. Obviously, okay. if you consider and you talk to the poor and you say, you know, actually, if you don't do that, actually, you can end, no? no. Okay. Very yes. damaged, yeah. no? Yeah, very um, important discussion. I think I have to stop it now to leave Rafael also some time for his presentation, since I think I borrowed already one minute or so from your discussion. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. Thank you very much again for presenting. And I will then hand over um, to our last presenter, um, Rafael Garrafa, who used to be at COP at uh, the University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil when he participated in this exercise. But it's maybe no surprise that he took a deep a look at Brazil. He now changed his affiliation um, to the Joint Research Center of the European Commission in Seville, but he's still presenting some results um, related to Brazil, which was already mentioned as an important case by Jan. So we look forward um, to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sonia. And uh, thank you all for, for the, the discussion we, we're starting here.
Uh, actually, I will always be I always be part of the copy team, <laughs> in, in the sense that I had my all my PhD and my master formation there at the Federal University of Rio. So in that sense, I, I was still there. But uh, nice to have uh, new challenges here at the European Commission. So uh, as you mentioned, this is a, this is a this is a uh, a paper that we co-authored with that I co-authored with other colleagues from Copy. Uh, that uh, where we analyze the, the where I analyze the distribution effects of carbon pricing on households uh, in the case of Brazil. So uh, uh, I'll, I'll jump to the. Uh, uh, to the, this introduction, where I had planned to to show some of the the the, strict, the framework of uh, scenarios and ambition and comparison for, for the policy design of DMF, but uh, since Jan already took his time uh, greatly <laughs> explaining this, uh, I'll just jump to the to our setup, which which is uh, in that case uh, the our scenarios were largely. Solely based on the uh, on the I/O baseline, uh, with uh, uh, NBC two degree ambition, uh, and the results I'm going to show you today are only for the cooperation and uh, the, the ref the ref ref case where we have uh, each country has uh, its national uh, uh, cap and trade system or carbon pricing policy. So. Uh, this paper, I'm happy to say that uh, this paper is already published uh, in the energy economics. Uh, we, we, you can have more details there, of course. Uh, but we focus uh, mostly on the household incident. So we're, we're interested in, in looking at how recycling, different recycling schemes and tax rebates schemes apply to households in, in the case of carbon pricing, uh, or in the case of putting a, a carbon price in, in the Brazilian economy. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe uh, there's someone with uh, the audio open. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, listening to some background. Now. Thanks. And uh, of course, we are mostly uh, interested in the discussion, the discussing the distributional consequences of uh, this this design. So uh, I'd like to start with uh, a brief overview uh, brought by uh, uh, Bas. Uh, Brian and Jean Chateau in the Energy Economics 2015 paper, where they uh, they briefly uh, summarize they greatly summarize uh, the methods for including uh, income distribution in global CG models, which is our case here in the, in the EMF setup, 36 setup. Uh, they I, I would like to start with this this figure here in the on the right. Maybe I can use this pointer option here. Uh, of course, here we are focusing on the household side of uh, the circular flow of the economy, uh, and in the and 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 they we have clearly three aspects here uh, where heterogeneity can be uh, let's say represented uh, in, in CG models. Uh, the first one, uh, of course, the, the household endowments, uh, be it for uh, Financial assets, uh, capital endowments, so even uh, labor choices in terms of uh, leisure or, or, or work. The other one would be uh, uh, labor uh, wage rates or, or rent 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 rates uh, in terms of capital rates or labor. And the third aspect would be more uh, related to the demand side, uh, related to uh, Consumption preferences uh, or expenditure preferences, and these three aspects uh, are uh, somehow somehow covered by uh, by the by the several methods. Uh, one, depending on the method, you can cover uh, several of these aspects or not. Uh, and and, the, and in the paper, uh, they they greatly summarize the, the, the these three methods in, in terms of. Uh, uh, these three, three main uh, directions where CG modelers have taken uh, to represent heterogeneity of income, especially uh, on, for households. So the first method is a multiple household where uh, you have a, an explicit representation uh, of multiple household types, so depending on in the limit covering all, all the survey type sample, uh, household survey sample. 
usually departing from a representative agent in the, the, in the CG model, where it, which is split into multiple households. Whether uh, you have also the, the method that uh, probably we have seen in the presentation before by Israel, where we uh, where we couple macro the macro level simulation from the CG models with the micro simulation uh, models uh, like GIDD, like GID, uh, the one that just presented, uh, where we can simulate the the, the results from uh, coming from the macro level to the mi to, from to to the micro level, and the third method uh, probably is the last use of the the tree. Uh, you have the direct modeling of uh, income distribution. Uh, derived from historical data, you can focus. It's just focusing mostly on income and not covering much of the uh, an interesting aspect, which is the uh, consumption uh, side of the of the story. Let's say. And well, in this paper, we use uh, the multiple household method. We had a representative, representative, sorry, representative agent uh, for the Brazilian economy in the, the model. I'm going to show you in the next slides. Uh, and then we uh, split it into multiple households. Of course, uh, one additional point is, of, of course, you have you can have uh, an hybrid uh, sort of method where you can couple multiple household method with micro simulation. Then you had more and more information uh, to in, in your outcomes. So. Uh, now I want to dedicate a bit more of the time to, to take a look at uh, the slide and let me first briefly comment uh, about the, uh, the model that we are using. Uh, we use the total economy assessment model, the T model, uh, which is a recursive dynamic multi-regional CG model that uh, we started developing uh, in co in 2017 with other colleagues. And the main main idea was to couple this model with uh, an energy system model that, uh, which is the coffee model, uh, <clears throat> to analyze uh, climate change policies and, and etc. Uh, so this uh, this model is actually based on the G tapping guns, and then we in its static part, and then for the dynamic setup, we calibrate it to the to the energy. Uh, coffee model and other models uh, like MIT for, for elasticity, elasticities, for example, and so on and so forth. Uh, in th this model is uh, quite uh, quite standard CD model. We have uh, primary factor four primary factors represented: labor, capital, land, resources. Uh, capital and labor uh, are mobile across sectors, but not across regions. We have consumer preferences uh, represented as a CES, uh, constant elasticity of substitution function. And as I mentioned, uh, the setup is basically the static structure from the GTAP in guns. Uh, and we use the GTAP 9 database uh, in, the, in the analysis of the EMF 36, uh, 36 study. Uh, important to say that we have uh, here represented 18 regions. Uh, for the EMF, we only had uh, 14 regions and 10 sectors. Uh, in our current uh, standard setup, we use uh, 18 regions and 20 sectors. And international trade is, uh, follows the classic Arlington uh, aggregation. So uh, going for the left side of the picture, where we uh, uh, represent uh, here the the method to, to derive the multiple households. We start from the P, uh, POF survey, which is the Pesquisa de Orçamentos Familiares, uh, that's the household survey, uh, survey, budget survey, where it had a, a large sample of uh, representing more than 57 million households and, uh, in this sample. And then, of course, uh, that comes the, the difficult to uh, the challenge to aggregate this uh, into ten uh, multiple into ten household types, and, and and then and then of course it applies the same challenges for having the four hundred and seventy five production factors uh, go into four income sources and more than thirteen thousand goods and services go into the ten sectors, each sector representing one good and one services. So uh, that's the challenge, of course, of uh, CG models. And then we 
start relying on the information from POF, where we derive the shares of for labor capital, land, and transfers for each household here in this figure for, for the income side uh, for the for the the ten the ten households and the the first column you have the the the, sh the average for Brazil. Uh, we here we can see the larger share uh, of uh, capital for the for the highest deciles uh, income deciles, whereas uh, a, a larger share of labor applies to to lower in lower income deciles, and of course they all they receive a larger share of transfer from from the government. Uh, and from the looking at the expenditure side, we have uh, these ten households as well, but uh, uh, aggregated here in, in in terms of uh, the different sectors. Here we have represented eight sectors, which are because uh, probably coal and uh, I, I don't know the, the other one are not represented here, but you can see mostly the the, the consumption bundle. Go into into services, and uh, which is the orange one here, and manufacture, and of course, depending on the on the household, uh, lower income households uh, do expand a more part of the, their budget in, in energy and electricity, which is the blue one here, and uh, in transportation services, which is public trans transportation uh, as well, uh, whereas uh, higher Higher income households uh, do expand more in private transportation. Uh, you can see here in the, the yellow one. So this sort of uh, information was translated in, into the into the CG model. And then let me speed up a little bit here, not going too much into the details of uh, of the modeling, uh, but uh, focusing more on the on the questions we want to answer uh, in, in this setup. Uh, here we have uh, some questions, of course, uh, regarding the double dividend hypothesis, where the first dividend is already given by the setup. We have the, the decrease of uh, of environmental pollution, uh, given the, the budgets we are simulating there uh, for CO2 and energy-related emissions. And in the second uh, dividend, we want to uh, as actually assess if there's a, a greater uh, if there are gains, welfare gains uh, for for these households when uh, when considering different setups for recycling uh, the carbon revenue. So in the first scenario, we have the government keeping the whole revenue, uh, which is the gov scenario. Uh, these three uh, scenarios are different setups for lump sum transfers from the for for from from the from from, from the carbon revenue. Sorry going to the household. So the first one uh, is, is a lump sum transfer equally distributed to households. The second, uh, the POV, it, it, it is targeted to the poverty uh, households, uh, to income deciles, to, sorry, to households below the poverty line. And the third one uh, actually goes to the ex under uh, households under the extreme poverty line. So these are uh, really important uh, Simulations in terms of policy results that we want to achieve here, and then we have another two other simulations that account for the mostly for the the idea of getting a more efficient tax system, and then we we cover the uh, we direct the carbon revenues to rebate labor taxes or sale taxes. Uh, let me jump to the comment to the results. Uh, we can see here. Uh, uh, not not uh, signif significant differences across uh, scenarios in terms of carbon pricing, except in 2030, maybe for the VAT scenario where we can see a rebound effect, where because uh, the, the taxes for oil products uh, are reduced and then you increase consumption. Though, so uh, in this setup, of course, we don't have a, the rebound in terms of quantity, but it it, it is translated to prices here. Uh, overall, we have uh, quite uh, quite small prices uh, com as compared to, to other countries, and that mainly comes because uh, an important characteristic of the, the Brazil uh, energy metrics, which is uh, his its high higher 
its high share of re renewables, of course. So here in the figures A and B, we have the electricity generation by energy source in 2030, where we can see the share of uh, of, uh, uh, of each sources uh, in the baseline and in scenarios. Uh, we have actually an increase of fossil uh, of fossil fuel use in terms of uh, of uh, in, in, in the scenarios, but uh, this increase uh, is uh, 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 sorry. This is uh, this is of course changed. <laughs> this is the bay. Uh, I'm sorry for that. So that will be the scenarios where we have a reduction of uh, of fossil fuel due to carbon pricing, and then we have the baseline here in B. And then, of course, we have uh, the consumption of oil products and biofuels changing across scenarios. And this is an important characteristic of the model. We account for the biofuels and biomass in, uh, in the energy uh, matrix. And uh, here we can see that an increase of uh, biofuels is perceived as, in, as a trade-off for oil products in most scenarios, except for the, uh, the VAT scenario where we have uh, an increase of uh, oil products. Uh, let me uh, focus here on uh, welfare results. Uh, here we can see these four graphs that represent scenarios for lump sum transfers uh, in the in an equal basis, which is the this first first one here. Then we have uh, carbon revenue capital for the government and uh, two different rebate schemes here. We have a uh, on the horizontal axis, the income desires and the overall effect for for changes in, in, the, in the welfare, and we can see clearly. And, and please note that the the scales of uh, the i axis and the axis is are different. We can see clearly that uh, a huge uh, a difference comes from uh, when when transferring lump sum. Uh, transfers account for the huge different difference in terms of uh, uh, the equivalent variation of welfare in terms of source uh, as compared to the use. That is, the income side for is is accounting much more for for the di these differences here, especially for lower income households, as expected. And uh, whereas in the the other scenarios, uh, depending on on the uh, on the desire, on the income desire, we will have uh, a more balanced, uh, uh, res more balanced results in terms of use and source effects. Uh, these are shown, of course, uh, in terms of percentual change to the baseline in 2030. And uh, here we can uh, clearly see that there is no, uh, uh, especially for the in, in, in analyzing the, the rebates uh, scenarios. We can see clearly that there is no uh, uh, a strong dividend in terms of uh, second dividend in terms of uh, welfare gains. Uh, Two minutes, Rafa. Thanks, man. thanks, Max. Uh, and and then uh, for for this these two scenarios, we can see here actually that uh, we have uh, small welfare losses that account uh, around for let's say point point fourteen point seventeen percent uh, in terms of losses of welfare and the only scenario we have uh, welfare gains are, is the transfer scenario so uh, interpret uh, as a as a our interpret our interpretation for the second dividend is is, is quite uh, is quite not conclusive actually because we don't have a strong dividend and we can see only a weak dividend in terms of uh, small Gains in, in a few in a few households uh, in, in in these scenarios, especially for the middle income uh, households in the labor scenario. This can be seen more clearly in this figure, where we use the Atkinson equally distributed equivalent index. Uh, here in the in this figure, we have a, a, a higher uh, uh, a, a, a no uh, uh, 
sorry, we have this inequality aversion parameter where uh, here we, we have uh, no inequality aversion. Uh, and here we, we account for full inequality aversion uh, in this growing this growing direction. So I give uh, uh, I give a focus here on the on the overall uh, results for all, all scenarios where we can see that the green and the purple uh, lines here in this in this chart and in this figure here uh, they uh, account for High, uh, high uh, changes in terms of welfare from two thousand two from from twenty percent to forty five percent. If we account for full inequality aversion, uh, when when we have uh, lump sum transfers uh, targeted to uh, lower income and uh, extreme uh, lower income households, this is of course strongly progressive, but. Uh, coming to the higher picture here, we don't see this effect for uh, for the label uh, in that scenario. In, in the opposite side, uh, we can see uh, really small effects, and these were the effects I was referring before in terms of uh, a second dividend. And then, of course, we had a, also a counterfactual scenario where we uh, simulate uh, Brazil uh, being only the only region that does not uh, put a, par a price on carbon. So this is m actually more to disentangle uh, international from national uh, effects of carbon pricing. Then we can see here and have a, a more fair comparison, uh, comparison in terms of uh, welfare changes, but also ch in terms of uh, GDP changes. Uh, and this is uh, my, my final slide. So in terms of, uh, I'll start with the last topic since I mentioned, we found some really small moderate uh, growth, uh, GDP growth for Brazil, which is driven by uh, trade balance. So that scenario uh, actually was important to disentangle this international effects for, for, for Brazil. We can see this more in the paper, of course, and discuss it. Uh, and but most importantly, we have uh, carbon pricing being a, a, a strong source of financing of social spending in Brazil, and I think this is our key message here, because uh, of course, uh, uh, and this also goes in line with the discussion we had before in terms of oh we are only accounting for CO two energy emissions, uh, and not accounting for GHG emissions, but uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, many countries don't have uh, a carbon pricing policy in. In place, actually, and I and, and that's uh, an important message for uh, using this sort of policy as uh, a source of financing social spending. So here in the lump sum transfer scenario, we have a sixty on a monthly basis. We have a sixty dollar transfer cash transfer direct to the first decile households under the poverty line in our results, and increasing the the targeting. Uh, if, if we increase this to extreme it extreme poverty and this is five point five dollar and this is one point nine dollar a day line we have a uh, one hundred forty uh, dollars being uh, to the directed to the these households which is a huge difference uh, that we saw in the in the previous uh, welfare results uh, to finalize uh, I will stop just stop here I will have uh, discussed the welfare gains we have Source side impacts uh, prevailing in our, in our scenarios, and uh, we we suggest a weak double dividend in some, for for especially for a few low income desires. But uh, we 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 have to still work more on the labor market side uh, of our model to improve their representation and have and have maybe more flexibility in terms of representation. Another aspect that we should account for is uh, the informal sector in Brazil, which is very large, not only for labor market, but for firms as well. So these are sort of challenges for uh, representing in, in challenges for our next, for the next steps of, for of my colleagues in Brazil uh, that uh, actually work in the model. And of course, uh, including GHG emissions in the, in the further step would be highly uh, appreciated for, for the case of Brazil. Thank you very much, and I'll stop sharing the screen. And 
hand the, the floor to Sonia. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Rafael, for this um, presentation. Um, I encourage everybody to ask some questions. I don't see any uh, anything. You can just enter your name in the chat and then um, you could speak if you want. I actually do have a question uh, as, a, uh, as a starting point. Um, I was, um, it was interesting for me to see the carbon price that you simulated because it seems to be much lower than the average carbon price that was in the EMF um, over all scenarios. And I was already always wondering whether this rather high price that most models find is, is realistic. And I was wondering that it might stem from the fact that most of us that are not really focusing on Brazil just took their standard GTAP um, uh, model and did not care about uh, modeling renewables in a specific way or model biofuels in a specific way. And you are some kind of Brazilian expert. Do you think that this is what is driving or what is in your, do you have any guess what is driving these high prices in the other models that might be unrealistic because we just don't care so much about the Brazilian specifics? Yeah, thanks, Sonia. Uh, great question. That's uh, that's an important point as well. Uh, we noticed that uh, our model actually has uh, lower prices. Well, uh, I will comment. Try to comment on two two points first. First, in terms of global prices, of course, uh, uh, in our results. Uh, the makers for China and India uh, are really uh, impressive in terms of uh, abatement potential. So that, that explains a, a lot about uh, in term, uh, carbon price in terms of global carbon pricing in our results. But focusing on Brazil, which is the second topic, I, I guess that uh, in our model, we, we of course uh, paid a lot of attention in, ter uh, in terms of representing uh, having a uh, right, the right representation for biomass and for biofuels in, in our model, and more 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 than that, uh, having uh, accounting for the right flexibility to uh, to change uh, to substitute uh, the, these fuels, uh, so that that might uh, explain uh, these differences uh, across models. Uh, many models rely, I, I, I guess, on the GTAP power uh, which I, I don't I know maybe Maxim can comment but I don't I don't think that we have bio uh, biofuels and biomass uh, accounted in there and and that might explain but of course we had other considerations in terms of flex flexibility that might might influence as well but yeah the great 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 point uh, in terms of uh, accounting for for this these differences and actually they they come a lot in, in our discussion I remember when we were uh, with uh, the whole group, uh, our colleagues from China actually were really impressed how our prices are uh, that huge uh, for Brazil, and we had some some discussions in, in this in this uh, in this aspect, as as you mentioned. Sorry, I didn't unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much. Are there any further questions? Um, I don't see any. Yes, I have oh, a question. That's then one last question. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Rafael, for the for the great presentation. I'm, I'm I'm just curious about what are the limitations of putting more information from the POF survey, no? Which is a household budget survey, no, very large, no. Uh, but what are the limitations of using that survey? And put more flavor into the labor part of the of the CG model. Yeah, thanks, Israel. Uh, in our model, actually, well, in terms of the limitation of the model, uh, we actually have a, a perfect uh, market for labor there. So ideally, we would have to account for a labor supply curve there in the, in the model, and try to get to. To grab some more information uh, in terms of what you just mentioned, there's there's a lot of information from informality uh, in the in the labor market there in the in the, in the survey as well and other surveys, not not only the port survey. Um, and there is a challenge. This is a challenge for for, for CG models, of course, uh, but it's in our it's in our let's say agenda for for future developments. So. Uh, but but I guess we did a, a great first step, and then, uh, anyway, this this is this is important as well for 
you mentioned that uh, the EMF study was actually a great first step for developing uh, the, the model in terms of uh, this representation we hadn't accounted for. So in our group there, uh, at Copy, the, the, the group there is mostly focusing on the energy side. And then a few years from now, they are starting to look at the economic aspects. And uh, I was happy to be part of this. And so the other colleagues are now uh, diving in the more recent uh, household survey. Uh, which is from 2017. So maybe future future developments uh, can account for this this sort of uh, uh, information. One other another aspect is is firms at originality, but we are not covering that <laughs> that in, in, the, in the model as well so far. Thanks, Israel. Yeah, thank you very much. Then I would like to thank all the presenters and um, also the GTAP team for setting up this conference here and um, all the participants for their, their questions and participation in the discussion. Um, yeah, I hope to see all of you in another context and thank you. Sonia, yeah, yeah. just there was a message in the chat from Alan Fox that he has a question. Oh. I don't know. Maybe we have a minute. Ah, okay, sorry. Question. I just overlooked it. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sure. no, it was late in arrival. Uh, I apologize for for not jumping in earlier here. Um, I just had to think a little a little more about what I wanted to ask. And and this goes back to what um, I'm kind of fascinated about. I'm sorry, I haven't read the paper, but just looking at the results from your slide on the distributional effects of carbon pricing and uh, the ex and specifically with the, the tariff mechanism that you use, uh, which of course disproportionately uh, allocates towards uh, the lower, lower deciles. Um, and, or well, I guess disproportionately might not be quite the right way to put it. Um, and thinking about how, uh, on the this EV source, um, it skewed so high, you know, five percent, three percent increases, two percent uh, on thirty percent of the population is getting a two to five percent bump. But of course, when we go and uh, look at the all results all the way to the right, it's teeny tiny, right? So that it is only greater that you know, eyeballing it here. 70% uh, of the population does better than the average, if I'm thinking about this properly, which kind of goes to the question, you know, as we, we think about utilitarian, uh, uh, you know, in our utilitarian framework for EV, you know, money metric utility, uh, just as a reminder, it's like, well, the aggregate results are, you know, it, it's a better deal for 70% of Brazilians. Um, I don't know if you could sp speak to that a little more, um, but and and the remarkable thing is it does not really seem to come at a great cost, even to those remaining thirty percent. Um, so you know that just really jumped out at me as far as uh, mechanism choice and uh, a, a vastly more uh, effective social outcome. Thanks. Really like the like the like that the approach that you're taking that it's very interesting yeah thanks a lot Ellen, for Ellen, for for the question and, and and thanks a lot for reminding me that an important information is actually uh how income is distributed in brazil brazil is, has the second worst income distribution in the world in terms of uh uh larger larger countries so i think it's quite close to uh, i can't recall this maybe Maybe Russia, I, I don't know. But, uh, and that explains a lot why we have this so, uh, so this disproportional, but I, I'll take it at the opposite side, uh, proportional effect, but we, we are trying to uh, increase the, the income for lower uh, households. So, right, so that's the, the, the policy goal there in our, in our study. So that's, uh, that's mainly because uh, you, ha you have, in, uh, in lower income household deciles up to the eighth decile. So, uh, of course, this share go, goes uh, decreases, but uh, you can find, you can even find uh, a lower income households, let's say the first uh, 
cut in the in the income in the eighth decile. That explains a lot. So this is how, because uh, income is highly concentrated. So uh, this is the, the the main aspect driving this these results, of course. And of course, the second aspect is the targeting of the policy. So when we do transfer uh, these rents to the lower uh, income, targeting the 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 the, the, the transfers. Uh, the results uh, arise. So uh, I think it's a it's a strong message uh, for us to consider in terms of uh, including at least uh, a, a carbon pricing policy. Although this this is uh, strictly related to energy uh, use emissions, CO two emissions, but it's a first step. So as I mentioned, many countries don't have it, and then uh, a strong appeal would be. Targeting for the for the lower income in terms of ex social acceptance, uh, in terms of uh, bringing the, the the policy to the public, and and that's that's uh, that's an interesting aspect. And so, if a final a final comment, uh, a question that always comes uh, when I present this paper uh, or in the previous uh, uh, presentations is, oh, how do you transfer this this money for the how do you target this this money for the, the lower income? And uh, fortunately, Brazil has a, a great experience in, in terms of uh, lump sum transfers from the government to, to lower incomes in a program called Bolsa Família. I don't know if many of you are aware of it, but it started around 2010, I think. And and it's it's uh, in terms of admin, administrative burden, it's fairly uh, fairly. Uh, let's say uh, cheap in terms of cost. Uh, it's it accounts uh, for less than 0.5 uh, percent of the GDP. It's it's a, quite impressive in terms of, uh, of its success. So yeah, these are the, these are my comments, Alan. I'm not sure if, if that answers your your point, but I hope so. Oh, absolutely. I mean that that emphasizes it more so that not only is this a highly effective. Uh, uh, policy mechanism, but it's also feasible. Um, and even looking at age 10, where I would intuitively have expected uh, a, a sort of negative outcome, in fact, it's effectively indifferent. So uh, despite the, if you looked only at the aggregate numbers, it really wouldn't tell you uh, the, the underlying story, which is a powerful one. Yeah. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> Okay, I don't think I will repeat myself. So I think what's left to me is just to wish you all uh, a nice rest of the day, how long ever this day may be in the different places you are. And um, yes, thanks again for participating and um, bye bye from my side. <laughs>